right, welcome back. This episode of Outside the Vines has a distinct flavor, a distinct wildcat flavor. And I got to say, ever since we launched this podcast, this is the guest I've had like at the top of my list. Ooh! NBA champion. He's like a beloved media personality now, former Arizona Wildcat, winemaker Channing Fry. Welcome oh. to the podcast. This is exciting for us. Thank you. Actually, I'm not a winemaker. I try to tell people that. Uh, I'm a okay, vintner, you're a wine so master. I own the business. I'm an owner mm -hmm. of the business. But the reason why you should like our wine is because we actually have real winemakers making our wine. And it's not just my opinion on things. So I hired the experts to make expert amazing wine. So that's that's the difference. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. And, and Chosen Family, we're going to be drinking the 2019 Pinot Noir tonight. And I want to talk right. about the label and we'll get into all that. We, there's so many things I want to ask you about. But okay. usually when we kind of start off, we, we get a sense for how you got into wine. So what's what's the right. origin story of, of your first kind of foray into understanding that there's something special here? I, I love telling people this story because I think it... Uh, I was just at Lewis and Clark talking to a bunch of sophomores, juniors and uh, in an entrepreneurial class. They're like, well, how did you, you know, they're asking the same question as you. How did you get into wine? And I was like, the story I'm going to tell you is something that you should apply to any other thing, other, whatever motivates you as wine, right? You got to take an experience and then you got to take that feeling and then realize how to make that into something you do every day because then it's not a job. So long story short, I got traded from the Knicks. I met my wife the first day I moved to Portland, right? Literally within six hours. That's 12 years ago, 14 years ago. So every summer I'd come back, she would take me wine tasting. Every summer I'd go wine tasting, it became more than just wine tasting. It was a chance for me to put my phone down. It was a chance for me to be outside, uh, to listen and learn. I love art. My mother loved art. Um, I, I, in my house, I have just for the most part, all local artists from Oregon. Um, I feel like art is something you can sit and talk about and not be decisive, right? It doesn't have to be, this is trash or this is the best. There's no, there's no one piece of art that is the best. And there's no wine bottle that is the best. Everybody's opinion is right. Um, and people take the time and, and they're quiet and they listen. Um, so Fast forward all these years, right? Um, I go to Orlando. One of my good friends who uh, I have known for a long time, lived in, or, you know, lived in Portland, um, ended up getting a job at Longlow Estate, where the 19 Pinot is from, from Chosen. Um, and he was starting it. So this is six years ago. So 2015, 2016, I was going to Orlando. He goes, Channing, this wine, this guy Chase Renton is making is amazing. I was like, man, stop. You know, I don't drink peanut. I drink cabs. Like, I'm, I was that guy at the time, you know, ordering the, the most expensive cab on the menu just to kind of boss up on people, not knowing what the hell I'm <laughs> supposed to drink. So he sends me this box, six pack. I absolutely crush it. So my wife, after two kids, can't drink red wine. She has to drink white wine. So she gets a couple bottles of Chardonnay. I said, oh, damn. <laughs> what is this? What is this? This isn't a big old oak butter bomb Chardonnay, you know what I'm saying? Like the old school style. And he's like, no, we're making this fresh with acidity, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, damn, this is good. So I start to ask questions. Fast forward two years later, I'm on the Pinot scene. So I come back, we're going to Bergstrom, Beaufort, we're going to uh, Sequitur, we're going to uh, Granville, Hazel Firm. Um, I'm missing. I'm, I'm missing people, but I can name who's who in the valley. I'm every weekend. I'm trying to be out in the valley, just learn it. Like yes, like my brain is exploding. Um, and so we went to the Cavs, and for me, here, here's how the the season actually goes. We practice from eleven to two, eleven to one. You get on a plane. And Cleveland actually has the shortest flights of anybody in the league based on where it is in the Eastern Conference, right? The farthest place in the Eastern Conference we have to go is the Miami Heat, and that's two and a half hours. So that's even not, that's not a big flight compared to Portland or Phoenix or New York where, you know, where, where I was. 
So I'd get on and after practice, I'd have a couple Oregon bottles with me and I would drink them, write a little note about them and then text it to my guy, Jake. So Tristan and Kevin were like, hey, you just not gonna, you can't just be bringing one bottle for yourself. I was like, I'm not supplying the whole team. So we end up getting in a little tiff, I like to say, and we made a rule. If you were gonna bring one, you had to bring six. So then I started bringing a six pack to the team. We would all share, I would explain it, right? I would say, this is from Oregon. This is what this is. This is the great, this is the clone. So I'm educating myself. I'm educating my team. Then the next person's time. So I brought exclusive almost only the Northwest. Sonoma Coast Pinot, Oregon, Willamette Valley Pinot, and just a little of like maybe a Washington cab, right? I was a baby about Washington and Walla Walla and all the different varietals, but I'd snag one of those because it's from the Northwest. Kevin's bringing Napa Cabs, Bond, Futo, uh, you know, what brands, right? Uh, you know, Stag, Stag's Leap, everything. Bronze bring a Sassacayas. So everyone had a particular style and that became our jam. Who would go out to dinner and what was their thing? And they would have a story. So those emotions started to rise up in me. Then next, and as I make this story way longer than what it should be. Um, long story short, we won a championship, but that wine culture was us. We go to dinner five, six hours, right? And everybody would have a story about their wine, why they picked it, blah, blah, blah. And it was all good. It was all great, right? After that, uh, both my parents died in between, I want to say, October 28th to uh, Thanksgiving. So my mom died of cancer, and then my dad died of, like, basically heart failure in one month. So I was broken. And that, that year, my boys were like, Channing, don't stay in your room. Come to dinner. Be with us. Like, really lifted me up. And the thing that was, is not necessarily the wine that lifted me up. It was the camaraderie. It was the conversations. It was the laughter. And I said, this feeling should be shared with everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Wine should not be something that's scary or snooty or, you know, anything else. It's literally an extension of you and what you like. It is your art. Um, and so, uh, you know, two years later, I end up retiring. I end up having conversations with Kevin's about, hey, let's do something on our own. I talked to Jake, I talked to Chase, and fast forward, now Jake, Chase, Kevin, and I uh, are all in business <laughs> uh, with Chosen Family, and we are absolutely having a blast. Is it a business? Absolutely. But we are loving who we are as a brand. Uh, we love who we are after one year. Uh, I think we've accomplished even more than what we assumed, but we're excited to keep going out We've been to Walla Walla. We've been to Napa. We're going to Sonoma Coast. Uh, we're going to the, I'm going to Willamette Valley tomorrow. Um, we're just always on a hunt for new, amazing people to collaborate with um, and new things to educate people with. So that when they go to the grocery store, a liquor store, a wine, wine store, they have an idea of what they're looking for and what they like so that they get exactly what they deserve with their money. I know it's a long story. All right. So I've got a question. And, you know, you that it was an awesome story, and but you didn't tell us what that Pinot was that turned you on. To uh, it. You didn't ninety-nine say, you didn't give us what was that Pinot. Ninety-nine Beaufrere. Beaufrere. Chase brought it over. I'm with you on that. Chase brought it over. Yeah. So Chase is the one he ruined me. So he's a winemaker for Longlow Estate, <laughs> um, and so he, I was just having a barbecue. People at the house. He brought over a bottle of champagne, uh, a light red or a white wine, so a long, low estate. I think he brought a Bethel Heights or maybe a Seagrid or something they knew my wife loved. Her favorite wine is Seagrid, uh, which is, to me, like, end all, be all. And then uh, a 99 Beaufrere, and he's big. He learned how to make wine in Italy, so he brought a Chianto Classic, Chianti Classico. Um, so for me, I was like, wait, why are we taking all these wines? He goes, Channing. Look what you're eating. And I looked and I was like, oh shit, the ch champagne goes with our, you know, Caprese salad. The white wine is for my wife 
who's, you know, now we're doing like prosciutto and bread. And then the light red is for the salmon. And then, you know, the bigger red is for like, you know, when we get into the steaks and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so my boys now, who I put on a game who used to drink whiskey and beers, well, they know when they come out with me, if there's four of them, just know we're drinking a bottle each of all this. And I'm like, this is a new champagne from this single vineyard, right? And I'm like, turned into a champagne dork. Like, I'm not a big old world guy just because I live in Oregon. So I'm still trying to like wrap my head around all these new wines. But champagne to me is like the unsung hero of the wine world that is just like, if you can get five or six and really just taste them at one time, I think people are going to think, what am I drinking at the grocery store? Like, yes, that's nice sometimes, but dude, just give champagne a, a chance. Give champagne a chance. I would agree. I think champagne is completely under, oh. underrated, when, uh, especially when it, as it goes oh. with food. It's one of those champagne and so sushi? Well Are you kidding me? My guy, Danny Sanders, will have, because I have four kids. He has four kids. Uh, he works, he has an amazing job over at Visa. And so we're busy. But when we meet each other, it's like uh, absolute boom. Here's all the wines. Here's all the sushi. Kids go run. Let's talk. What are you doing? What are you doing? And it's just like the most amazing flavor profile. Oh, my gosh. It's the best. Sushi and champagne. Y'all need to try it. I've got sushi downstairs waiting for me for dinner tonight. So I'm going to I may take you up on that. Have you had champagne and, and popcorn? Champagne and popcorn is another Ooh, kind of with the salt and the butter. Yes. Yeah. I'm a popcorn yeah. guy. I'm a, a dad turned me on to yeah. that. I'm a popcorn yeah. guy. No, it's, I'm telling you. It's my, my dad turned me on to that a few years ago, and it's it's the real deal. Oh, Can we talk so about good. okay, so chosen family? I want to hear the story behind, like, you know, how you just everything behind the labels, because I think there's some good stories okay. there. This is again the Pinot Noir that we're drinking tonight. And also just right, the name. Right. How'd you come up with chosen family? So I have one brother. Uh, I love this man, Logan, to death. Um, but when I, I, he's six years younger than me. And so what I've learned throughout my years of being an MBA, you choose your family. The people that you eat with, that you confide in, that holds you accountable when you're messing up, that lift you up when you need it. Um, after my parents died, I just went right back to the season. I, I don't think I should have now looking back, but I did. It, was, it is what it is. It's just how I was raised. It's how I was like, hey, put your feelings to the side. Go play sports, you know? That's not the right thing to do all the time, but I did it, whatever. There were my friends. I was living in Cleveland. It's 30 minutes to go to the, uh, to the practice facility. And I would call them at 6 o'clock in the morning for them. And they would pick up every single time. And I would be absolutely broken, like crying and like, why am I doing this? And like, you know. And they'd encourage me. Now, this is every day. They'd be like, Channing, are you driving from practice? Yep. They'd be like, all right, what's up? Or what, I'd ask them, what's going on with you? Tell me about your day. Vent to me. So those people became my family, right? When I got traded, my friends flew out and took care of my wife and kids, right? When I did something happen to me, whether I got hurt or something, somebody took my family home. So those people became my family, right? They're not all my blood, but at the end of the day, they became the people that I would share anything with. So when I find new wines, my biggest thing, my act of selflessness, I think that's the word, unselfishness, selflessness, is to want to share anything and everything with them to share that happiness. And so the label, the actual C with the W is the little gold thing. So there's three C's and three W, well, there's three, three, because at the beginning it was Chase, Jake, and I. Um, and the circle means all things come full circle. Um, and then each label, whether, you know, you're looking at the 19 Pinot, if you were to look at our Syrah, if you were to look at our um, Sonoma Coast, if you were to look at our Rosé, if you were to look at our Chardonnay, right? So this is our Chardonnay bottle. So that is also Longolo Estate. So we found pictures from the place that where it is. Also, if you look on this bottle, not a lot of people do this in the wine industry. It says Longolo Estate. So when we do collaborations, we give absolute love and attention to why we were inspired to do a collaboration with that winemaker. Um, and without Chase, 
I don't know if I would have loved Pinot as much as I do, right? I wouldn't have loved Chardonnay as much as I do. Uh, without uh, Brian at Hazel Firm, he put me on a Syrah. Now, this is the Gorge, right? It's fancy colors, but this is the Gorge where the Syrah is from, from Walla Walla, right? Now, this is our rosé. This is our pool where rosé is fun. Rosé is like all day, every day. This is our... <laughs> So this is Sonoma Coast, right? Where the two guys from Salty Goats, they go surfing and they showed us pictures. So we made this label specifically for them. And you'll see Salty Goats. So every label that we do that's a collaboration is a stamp of approval from a already certified winemaker. This is not me as an NBA player trying to sell you wine uh, because I'm Channing Fry because that, that doesn't even correlate. What does Channing Fry know about making wine? I know a little bit, but I couldn't do it myself. So I found pros that want to work with me, and I want to work with them, and we want to make collaborative wine uh, to not only educate, but to make it fun and approachable. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you know, we had Dan Costa on last episode, and he said, you know, if you can make a good Pinot Noir, you can do anything in the world. And I will tell you, Oof. I'm enjoying the heck out of this 2019 oh, Pinot Noir. You. Anyone who watches this show regularly knows that Glenn Parker is the one who actually has the palate. So Glenn, I'd, I'd love your thoughts ah. on, on what you make of this. Yeah, for sure. What you make of this and, and I'll tell you this. Before, before you say anything, I want to say this. A lot of people who are in this industry for the money don't like real opinions. But the fact that you will have an opinion about my wine, whether you're like, well, I like this more or I like this less, you're absolutely right. So people are so afraid to tell me opinion about it. I don't like if you love it. Yes. Awesome. Perfect. If you don't, guess what? Now I'm going to help you find something you do love. And we don't just make Pinot Noir and our Pinot Noir never tastes the same from year to year because that's not fair to you because every year is not the same. So before you say anything, I just want you to know this is this is whatever your opinion is, is absolutely right. So you don't have to hype it up, but I, I'm very interested uh, to see what you have to say. Well, to no, Jennifer, you have to know, I'm a Pinot yeah. guy. Um, anybody that knows me knows I'm a Pinot guy. And I'm an Oregon Pinot Ooh, guy. What's I, your favorite I, Oregon Pinot? All right. So uh, the original one that turned me on was Domaine Druin. Uh, yes. Lorette. And then oh, from there, so both good. Bears. I... I did both fairs in the uh, middle to late 90s. I went and toured the vineyard, really had a yeah, nice the time. The are amazing. Um, yeah, incredible people. And that those two are the ones that I go back to a lot. But there are so many. I love Bergstrom. I caught them right as they started yeah. up. So I, I started buying a lot of their their uh, wines. Um, what was that, Salish? I could keep going. Yeah, I think I like their Salish vineyard the best. Me personally, obviously in their white wine secret. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, uh, there's it's there's so many out there, like Saco Blosser, um, that they, they come around occasionally. Domain Serene comes around. They're, they're, um, you, it's so hard to go wrong yeah, with an Oregon Pinot. And so it, it, you, what I love about them is because they are so – they're much more elegant wines. Um but I, I like them because they're so they're much more of the French model wine uh, than a big bruiser. Yeah. They're not a big extracted <laughs> fruit model. And matter of fact, we were talking with Dan Costa. That's what I really liked about the wine that he sent us is it was not that cocktail yeah. wine. It was a it had a high alcohol percentage, but it wasn't hot. It wasn't extracted. It, it was a really nice yeah. drink wine. This one is so typical. And I you know I'll use the I use the French. Oh, it's not typique. You know, it's typique. It is. This is. It smell you get the you get obviously the right. red fruit right off the nose, but you get a little tobacco, which is really cool. It's that wet yeah. earth, or super you, wet earth. Particularly Newburg Dundee has that wet earth, and you get it comes through. It shine. It, it's part of it. It's part of what makes these wines so good. And what I like is that you can pick them all up without feeling like you're drinking a bowl of jam, but you're not getting astringent at the right. same time and i love that that's i i like this this is a wine i would drink this this would be an everyday wine i'd, I'd enjoy it every day i appreciate that you have been trying not to me, drink so. it every day but what's crazy is so 19 yeah. was a really wet year and so when we were there with chase in the, in uh uh the tasting he gave us the option of saying 
I can make it less wet. I said, no. We said, no, that's not us. If our 18, which sold out, was a dry year, and I actually opened it up, right? I had a bottle hidden, and I opened up the 18 to try the difference. It is wild to taste the difference. And so I hope people who are fans of ours appreciate that every year you may not love it, but you're going to know what you love. And when you go somewhere, you're going to go, oh, what's the difference between 18 and 19? 19 was a wet year. 20, there was smoke. So you should not be drinking no Pinot Noir from uh, from <laughs> Portland. No. And then 21, I heard Harvest has been crazy. So it's going to be crazy, amazing wine this year. Um, and then we're not even going to talk about Chardonnay because that's another one I'm really kind of into. But yeah, it's it's... Every year we want to be true to to the to the year. We're not trying to just Frankenstein this wine for you. We're trying to make sure that you go, oh man, I have two bottles that's 18. I want to try one now and wait a couple of years on it if you have the ability to do that. So it's been fun. You know, I'm I'm curious, Channing, with obviously the, this whole podcast is centered around the idea of, of sports and wine. And so we hear from professional athletes who have gotten into uh, wine and winemaking. And in the NBA in particular, you look around and there's a lot of NBA players who clearly, like yourself, have gotten into it. What What do you think it is or what's the is there a connection other than what you kind of alluded to earlier about just the family that you choose and what wine allows you, how how it allows you to connect with people? Well, I think first of all, it starts like this, right? So, and this is very, I don't know the word. I'm, I'm kind of having a brain fart. It's but another you can drink wine, a bottle or two of wine and still perform the next day. That's the honest truth. Back in the day, guys were drinking beers. You can't drink beers like that and perform the way you need to. It's, impo- it's almost impossible. Guys today are at such peak, and this is, a whole, sorry, we're, we're getting into two things. The level of play for across all sports is unprecedented at an unprecedented level, whether that's soccer, whether that's football, baseball, basketball. Why is that? These kids are, for the most part, not even really going to school, right? They're not playing on the outside court with Joe Schmo. These kids are literally massaged and, and put on a river towards professionalism. So their bodies are at peak performance. They're able to access film whenever they want. So their minds work differently. So for a guy to say, hey, at night, I want to go out to dinner with my wife and have a glass of wine or I want to have whatever, how can I do that and be an adult and also perform the best way tomorrow, right? So if somebody's going to spend like LeBron, a million dollars on his body, why is he going to drink a $15 wine, right? Is he not going to put the best thing in his body or a conversation piece, not only for himself, but for the people around him, he's going to start to research that. Now, that attitude turns out it goes with your teammates. Also, to think of where sports is with business. Think about all the players on the Warriors in Silicon Valley. Think about how many investments... Kevin Durant has done with cryptocurrency or think about all the businesses, the entrepreneurs, these guys are going out to business. If you're ordering, no offense to Hennessy and Coke, you ain't ordering a Hennessy and Coke with a Fortune 500 guy. When he's ordering a, 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 a burgundy, a white burgundy, and you don't understand what that is. So the language changed. We evolved. We're not just basketball players anymore. Guys are reading wine books on the airplane, trying to figure out what years they like. They have people who are literally going over and getting 1982 Petrus on the the big magnum size because they go, I want to have my birth year for for my daughter. That's not, that's that's because of the information age, right? I had an opportunity when I went to Bordeaux to go to Petrus. And honestly, I'd never heard of it. Understanding their process and seeing what it was. And he was like, yeah, Jimmy Butler was here last week. And I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah. Jimmy Butler and Exum and this guy and this guy. So the information of understanding what's the best wine is not only an investment, it's a opportunity to challenge your mind 
and get exactly what you want. And it's like, you can have a nice Rolex. Guess what? The, the other millionaire across from you got the same Rolex. You got an 83 uh, DRC now. Okay. Now we doing something. And I think that type of attitude, um, that type of intelligence of what you're putting into your body, uh, what you want to, how you want to not only impress, but to engage in conversation through drink um, is something that is, is taking over the league. I was just going to say the basketball players get into it because they make scads of money compared to the rest of the guys. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not cheap. I know some football players were crazy players one, one list. Uh, I just think basketball players. Oh, you should have seen mine at one time, oh, Channing. Trust me. It was, it was crazy. I would have a nice <laughs> wine, wine cellar if, if like people stopped coming over to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, but I can ask you, you said that, you know, if you're going to invest so much into your body, then you're going to make sure that you're drinking nice wine. But if you had like $20 to spend on a bottle of wine, what are you buying? Ooh, what varietal or what exact bottle? Either, both. This is like the news you can use type information for the wine. I think for like $20, right? Mm-hmm. I need to know the setting because I'm okay with this. Okay. I'm okay with 20. If we're, at, if we're at your pool, what if we're at your pool? Oh, you're at the pool? Oh, <laughs> no, I'm saying your pool. What if we're at your pool? <laughs> you're at my pool? Yeah. I'm getting two. I'm going to try to find two Pinot Noir rosés and I'm chilling them till it's like almost frozen. And them things going to be hitting. All right. Those things going to be hitting. It's hard okay. to make bad rosé from Oregon. It's hard to make bad rosé unless you just don't give a fuck. And that's just I'm like, you're just like, here, just, it's hard. I think rosé is rose. the most unglamorous thing. Yeah, you probably got to edit that, but uh, yeah. the most unglamorous thing, but yet it's the the biggest party thing. And, and we're excited to do it, but we also have Cabernet coming from Napa Valley. We also have bubbles coming four years, traditional uh, shampooing method. Um, what else we got? Sonoma Coast. We got uh, two different types of Chardonnay coming out. We have two different types of Pinot Noirs coming out. I mean, we have, we're hunting That's for awesome. stuff, you know? It's awesome. Oh, thank you. So you'd go with a, a Pinot, a Pinot, a rosé, a rosé of Pinot. So, I got no, you. no, so. Because there's also. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't want to interrupt. No. No, I, I think that's what you said. You'd probably go a couple bottles of rosé of Pinot, for sure, Noir, right? For sure. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, but I also. I, I, I like a, around a pool, You can't. it's hard to, as you've already said, it's hard to go wrong yeah, with rosé. It's, it's, it's Yeah, cheap. yeah, because it fits it's it. not, it's not red. It's not white. But it's also like bubbles, cheap bubbles lose their fizz in the sun. You keep this rosé on ice, you're solid, right? I think uh, also like, you know, I don't want a, hang a hangover. I don't want a big hangover, right? I mean, it's just not, it's, I'm, too, I'm almost 40. It's like, Lord have mercy. Like, let's drink good wine so we feel good tomorrow. I got shit to do. I'm going to give your rosé the best compliment I can give it, which is what my husband says when he has a rosé that he loves. He said, this is very chuggable. This is very chuggable. Oh, yes. Your, your rosé is very chuggable. So, Thank you. You yeah. know what? That's our <laughs> second of our third. Each really one of our Oregon winemakers got to make their own mm -hmm. wine, or we asked them to make their own wine, our own rosé. Uh, so the first one's from Longolo. That sold out in two days. Uh, that was more grapefruit, more citrus, more acidity, and certain people like that. A lot of people like that. Then you have this one, which is more Chardonnay, what's well, 80 20? Chardonnay mm -hmm. rose, which is different for people. I feel like it's, I think the right word is like salinity. It's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit round in the feel. Um, but again, chuggable. It's like, oh, I didn't know I'm done with it. And then this next one. Yeah is going to be from Hazelfern, first one from Longolo, second one from uh, Granville, third one from Hazelfern, uh, is going to be a little bit sweeter, a little bit of mix of both, but more of like, oh man, strawberries, peaches, 
So we call that the, the autumn rosé. A lot of people go, oh, the weather's not rosé weather. Stop it. Stop it. When your kids are <laughs> going trick-or-treating, get you, get you a little canteen like this. Fill this bad boy up with some rosé. <laughs> or for your friends, it'll be the best trick-or-treating in your life. So uh, obviously the autumn rosé will be called chuggable, mm -hmm. chosen chuggable yeah. rosé. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask for a part of that. Yeah, that's good. You no, 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 no. Yeah, as oh. long as you're over 21, you're being responsible. What you do with the bottle of wine is up to you. But yeah, if you chug it, you probably won't get another one. There's only a few left. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I got to ask, is, is your wife, I mean, your wife is the one who kind of introduced you to wine, it sounds like. Is, uh, yeah. What does she make of all of this? Or is, does she get to weigh in? And how is, you know, how involved is she in, in Chosen Family? So she is the most supportive person. Uh, I think when I retire from basketball, I just stopped doing everything for six months. And I went bananas. And this honest truth. I went nuts. I just... I'm not used to making my own schedule. I'm not used to not waking up trying to better myself or better something, right? You know, when you're in the league, you're like, what do I need to do? Who am I playing? What do I need to eat? Do I need to stretch? Do I need to lift? Do I need to shoot more? How do I feel? What's my elbow? Where's my mental? You, like, it's me, 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 me. And then when I like, when all that went away, there were too many things uh, that were happening for me. So when I had the opportunity to do this, this gave me something to like meditate about. So it wasn't just, it's not about me, but it's about my vision for a unique opportunity as a young black wine vintner owner, uh, founder, whatever you want to call me in Oregon. I think there's only three of us, CJ, myself, and the guy from Abbey Creek. Um, and I'm just trying to do it right. And that motivation has calmed me down, um, got me into reading books, meditating, uh, just educating myself. Um, and me and my partners, uh, Jake and Chase and Kevin, talk three, four, five times daily just about our vision. What's next? What do our customers want? What do we want? What's best for all of us? Like, I don't know how other businesses are run. But I feel like we are trying to be so conscious of like truly putting what's in our mind in a bottle for everyone and not just an elite group of people. We're trying to make stuff for everybody um, and encourage people to try one and, and to uh, just be one bottle. No, nobody drinks. Let's say you drink every day. No judgment. We just want to be one of those days. And we want you to have a story for your friend. That's it. We just want to be one of those days. We want you to have a story for us. We don't want you to just, we like it if you buy it because the labels are pretty. They are. But we want you to know about us. We want you to know, uh, we want you to trust us uh, that we're doing the work and we are grinding. Yeah. How good are your kids at it? Yeah, I leave. No, awful. <laughs> if it's not chicken fingers, ketchup, and uh, <laughs> din tai fung, they don't know what, what it smells. You know, though, it's not with some of the way that, you know, some, of the, some of the adjectives I think out there, though, uh, in oh, the man. wine, you know, describe like that, that, might, that might actually be right. Like ham sandwich might be as apropos, <laughs> you know, for us. Yeah, you know what? I, uh, uh, all of us had chosen do not believe in that, telling you what yeah. you're supposed to taste or smell. That's it, it's not fair. It's not, you're not doing it. What do you smell? Oh, tell me what I'm supposed to smell. No, what? I'm not in your nostrils. You may have a cold, <laughs> right? Like, if you don't like it, you don't no. like it. Hey, how about this? We have one, two, three, four, five. We have seven different, we're going to have 10 different types of wine. If you don't like that one, we'll get you something else. We will find it for you. And that's why I think it's it's awesome. And people sometimes don't get that gift um, from people to say, hey, it's okay if you don't like it. Or it's okay if yeah. you love it, let me find something else you love. Because I want you to share this with people. I want this to be important to you, right? I value your $35, your $70, your $100. I, I do. I honestly do. So, but okay. So speaking of sharing it with people, and obviously your, your kids are, are essence tasting with you. Dan Costa, to bring him up again from our, our last episode, was the thing that blew my mind was that he started, he, had a, he started tasting wine when he was five years old. Started drinking Burgundy Ooh. when he was five years old, which 
Oh no. You know, I and obviously he's uh he's grown to one of the most unbelievable successful winemakers out there. Do your kids drink? You've got four of them at home, if I recall. No, they smell. Smell. They smell. How old? Your oldest uh, is what? 11? 10, 11? Yeah, about to be 11. Yeah, yeah, about to be 11. 11, 9, 5, and 3. They get to smell, no tasting. Um, they think they have tasting. They think it's nasty, which is fine. I mean, even for me, like, I'm an 80s baby. My, my parents had one bottle of, like, Merlot above the <laughs> fridge, Right. And like the, the little thing. And then like Christmas, they're like, somebody goes, well, let me get a bottle of wine. And they're like, here you go. I'm from Phoenix, <laughs> Arizona. We know Corona's, Pacificos and great tequila. And I was on that for a long time. Right. I still love a good tequila. I think the tequila industry is getting crushed right now. But, you know. So talking about hoops, uh, what have you made of Arizona? Have you followed much since you left? I know some guys do. Yeah, some yeah. guys don't. What do you think the direction of that program right now? You so know, I was down in. there uh, two weeks ago. I had a great chance to meet Tommy. Uh, I, you know, I think for me, right, it's, we are such a, a big time family, right? Whether that's Steve Kerr talking to Andre, whether that's Judd talking to me, whether that's Luke and Richard talking to, you know, Chase Budinger, or, you know, Jared Bayless, it doesn't matter who you are, right? If you're a Coach Olsen guy, you get it, right? You love Arizona. Like, and I think certain schools say that. I don't know if anybody loves or respects their school and what was given to us as much as guys from Arizona during certain eras, right? Coach Olsen used to say, do your job or I can find somebody to do your job. And he would have McDonald's All-Americans sitting on the bench because they thought things were supposed to be handed to him. Uh, he passed away, which was sad and heartbreaking for all of us because that man taught me how not only to be a man, but to be a pro. And if you look at all his players, you can look at upwards of more than a billion dollars of NBA contracts. We have 46 people there, right there. I think 10 or 12 of them were head coaches. Two or three of them were in the media. And three or four of them were just there. 46 out of God knows what, 150. Four or five of them were elite agents or had big time power in the NBA. So the basketball world is intertwined with Coach Olsen's U of A team. And the biggest thing Coach Olsen always said was that Tucson is your gas station. When you're tired, when you're when you're you're sad, when you don't think you can do this, just imagine. Look at the people in these stands. These sixteen thousand five hundred people in the stands. I think I think it's either sixteen thousand five hundred or fifteen thousand six hundred. We got to check that. We're gonna stat check that. But like, we'll fact check. I love Tucson. I'm from Phoenix. Uh, to be able to have the opportunity to play at Arizona, like was changed me as a human. Um, I am who I am to this day because of that city, uh, because of those people. I was prepared to play in the NBA for 14 years because of how I was not only coached, but how my teammates were. It was never about stats. If you look at most of his players, I think other than maybe Salim or Gilbert Arenas, who wasn't a lottery pick, who was a second round pick, Nobody was the leading scorer on their team who went lottery, right? If you let's, we can start looking. So that means yeah. those players affected winning. And um, I think, and to bring this all around, I think Tommy Lloyd is going to have guys who affect winning. I don't think they're going to be, I, I, I would hope that they're going to be superstars, but I know that his players will be pros for a long time. Time. They're going to be champions in the NBA. They're going to be great people. They're going to be great players. Um, I'm excited to watch them. Um, they have my guy Jack Murphy and Jason Gardner on, on staff. And I'm excited for them and these kids to sort of get an experience that I got. But, you know, sort of. <laughs> you know, we didn't have cell phones. Cell phones were sort of new. And even if somebody had a cell phone camera, 
it took 47 seconds to hit that flash in the club. <laughs> so you could you kind of definitely do it now. You know? And there was no social media. There was, yeah. No that social was media. It was just aim, you know, the, the oh, aim wow. thing. If you were getting dings at like 11, somebody knew where the after party was. Meanwhile, during Glenn Parker's era, that was like when TikTok really, you know, was. <laughs> Glenn. Can we still have real revenge? Hey, so wait, Glenn, 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 you Glenn went when Steve Kerr went. So that was when Revenge of the Nerds was there. Yep. Yep, Revenge of the Nerds was filmed in 86, yeah. I think, there, 85. I got there just a little later. I, I left school in eight, after the 89 season. So, hey, season, Steve so. told me it was cracking. <laughs> there was a lot of things going on back then. Of course, that was also with uh, Major League was filmed Ooh. in town. You know, with uh, we were going to do like a whole other podcast for like the uh, Arizona, like the Tucson story. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, a lot of them now. Uh-huh. <laughs> a lot of them now. You know, that, <laughs> Shannon, you you make a point though that I have heard, and in, in the time that I've spent around Arizona over the last ten years since I've been working with the Pac-12 that it, it really is. And they say all the time, you know, like, oh, we're like a family here. We're like a family here. Everybody says that. But Arizona, I, I feel it. I really do. And, you know, I, I had a chance to to get to know Adia Barnes pretty well. And it's been amazing to see what oh, she's built there with the women's program. She's amazing. And it just the support that they the different programs have for each other and just that there is a feeling that's that's the number one thing I hear when I talk to people who are Arizona Wildcats of just the, the feeling of family. So I know that, you know, even you and, and Glenn made, you know, you were there at different times, but I, I think anytime that there are two Arizona Wildcats on the same screen oh, or in the same room, like there's a connection. We, we always go, Hey, oh, yeah. no no gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> no, unless for two seconds, let's give Adia Barnes her flowers. Um, that woman turned that women's program around so fast because she wants to play basketball the right way. And she holds her kids accountable and they appreciate the opportunity to play that way, right? She's already put somebody in the WNBA after two years. Now, obviously that kid had talent, but come on, man. Like yeah. we have to acknowledge winning is winning on any level and she is winning the right way and as a U of A Wildcat, we always, we take for granted softball because they just dominate like God. I mean, forever volleyball, uh, swimming, a baseball team has crazy players in it. Our football team's kind of like, you know, obviously we're kind of poo-poo pee-pee right now, but you know, I think we have like the, yeah. <laughs> the longest losing streak, but <laughs> we're hopefully, we're, yeah, it's getting ugly. we can always get worse. It can, yeah. We can always be last. That's but right. I feel like, you know, you can't judge a guy in his first three games, you know, but the NAU loss yeah. again. Gosh, shit, edit that out. God, yeah. they suck so bad. <laughs> hey, you know what? It, 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 it is hard, you know? It, it, I'm used to the Dick Tomey years. I was a Dick yeah, Tomey oh, yeah. guy. He built on what Larry Smith did. Storm? Oh, and, you know, we were – we won – games a lot of games over a lot of period and it's just but it's here's the thing that i will remind really is, both but. of you of and again i think you i don't have to tell you guys but adia barnes that it was her second year they won it was four years before she took them to the national championship they won four games i mean yeah. four games yeah and so it, just to think about where you you start and, and hopefully where you finish and no one has patience in this day and age, but I do think that it's, it's about going about the process the right way. And she certainly did that. And to see what she's done. I mean, she says it like you could hear a pin drop in McHale when oh, she yeah. first took over that program. There was maybe mm-hmm. nobody on the stand. Nobody went. Oh, and no, now it's, it's as hot of a ticket as there is. The, you know, it's just been really cool to see what she has done. And uh, man, I just couldn't love that. Do you know how many ever. wins coach Olson had in his first year? No. How many? Do you know how many wins he had the next year with Steve Kerr and Sean Elliott? 24. So to us, as basketball players, we respect the crap out of that. And we hope that she is there because Richard and the older guys was there with her when she was a player. And I think for us, obviously, you know, almost like a a legal mob, we want to keep it in the family. Because then they get it. Mm-hmm. But I think, again, yeah. going back to men's basketball, Tommy gets it. Tommy gets it. And Tommy 
is starting to understand if you do it right, you got the support of some heavy hitters yeah. and the support of the, the 5 2 0, right? You know, the two the T Lopes are going to be out and about for you. They will ride and die for you if you're playing good basketball and making men and great basketball players and putting a good product out there, right? And uh, I, I'm excited about this year. I'm excited about the recruiting classes next year and the year after. Um, I'm excited about these kids getting an opportunity to prove themselves uh, in the Pac-12. Chan, I got to just say one last thing and then, and then we'll say goodnight. But the first time I got to meet you and talk to you was on a podcast for around Mental Health Awareness Month. And you talked about when you retired from the NBA that the thing that was most important to you was to kind of like unravel yourself and figure out what was the thing that was going to get you up in the morning. And I just got to say, listening to you talk about wine and knowing kind of where you are right now, even a year and a half later from when we first met, I just, uh, it makes me really happy because I can tell you're lit up. Oh, I can tell you. this lights you up and it's an unbelievably delicious wine. And thank you for sharing it with us. We appreciate you. Oh, of course, guys. Anytime. I, if you were here, I would have shared 50 yeah. wines with you. All right. Well, then we're coming out. Then <laughs> that's the case. Well, listen, stop it. Don't, don't be afraid of a good time. Uh, we know we are not, we are not chosenfamilywines.com. Uh, it's delicious. And, and thank you, thank Janet. We appreciate you. you. Cheers. I appreciate thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.